coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. So the next thing we look at when we're breaking down a cold email is we're going to look at the length and the spacing. Uh, the general rule of thumb, unless you're doing something that's really customized with some unique content, the general rule of thumb that we judge an email on and how to get an A is to not make it more than a smartphone screen long. So the problem is if you make a really long first email with a lot of information in it, what happens if the person by some miracle agrees to do a call with you? What are you going to talk about? You just shot all your bullets off in the email. At a minimum, I think a rep should be able to send 30 personalized emails a day. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barron, and I'm the host of The Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, I've got a real treat for you. He is a legend. He's been on the show probably four or five times now. It is Ryan O'Hara. He is the VP of Marketing over at Lead IQ, which you can find over at leadiq.com. And on today's episode, we're going deep into how to create the ultimate cold email. Ryan breaks it down step by step, section by section. There's a ton of value in this episode. And so with all that said, let's jump right into it. Well, Ryan, you're killing it with your own uh, rate my pitch content. So we'll touch on that in a second. But basically, you're rating whether a cold email is good or bad before it even leaves the the, the laptop or computer that the, the seller's sending it from. So with that said, Ryan, how do you rate an email before you get the the obvious feedback from the buyer. Yeah, so I, if we go back many years ago, uh, this idea kind of came to me from, what I, I was watching, um, all right, so this is actually the true story. The CEO of, of Lead IQ May, her daughter was using her laptop and I was using her laptop at an airport and I was on YouTube trying to get a video uploaded for YouTube and I noticed that all the suggested videos were like, America's Got Talent, <laughs> where they're like hitting a button. And, and I was like, I was like, wow, that's really weird. Um, May must really like these videos. She's like, oh, my daughter watches all these videos. And I was like, huh, how cool would it be to do that for cold email? Um, so we, a couple of years ago, we did this first event live in San Francisco where we went and looked at cold emails. And um, I honestly didn't know what to expect. I didn't have a grading criteria the first time that we did it. What I really wanted to do was just go through a bunch of cold emails and give some tips about like how to make it better and all this stuff. And after doing two or three of them, I started to realize this is the criteria sort of what makes a good cold email. Mm -hmm. The first thing is obviously you want to look at the subject line. And I think a lot of people don't think about this, but if you're reading a blog post about best subject lines using a cold email, you're probably doing the wrong thing. The biggest reason is because subject lines are really subjective, no pun intended, to whatever you put in the body of your email. So like, for example, if I put a subject line in an email um, and it, the subject line has nothing to do with the what's actually in the heart of the email, you're kind of doing some like misleading stuff in sales. And you're actually going to disappoint the person that you're prospecting. Uh, and that's just kind of a bummer, obviously. So mm -hmm. subject lines are one of the things that we look at that's really important. So if you set up a subject line, a good subject line will have the following characteristics. It'll be vague enough to get someone to open an email. It will go into, uh, it will hint at what you're going to talk about. And it's not your company, it's not your solution, it's not their company, it's not their solution. It's whatever piece of personalization that you were going to put in the email. So if I were going to email you, Will, and say like, hey, Will, I know you're into drumming, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I mentioned that like, I, I know you used to be a drummer or something. I might say, hey, well, I was looking on YouTube for you watching your podcast and I found an old video of you playing drums at this gig. I might write your drumming as my subject line. You're going to open that email, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, like that's the thing. You get people to go in by understanding the context of why you're reaching out. And that's what that's really what it's about with the subject line. So that's one of the things we look at to start with. If you can't get the open, the battle's over. You know what I mean? And that's what it comes down to with a cold email anyway. Let, Next, let me, let me ask really you this, look, Ryan, before we, because yeah. you'll be rattling through with 30 minutes if, if I don't interject, mate, as you go through each yeah. of these steps. So yep. one thing that I do want to ask here is, is a cold email a cold email or does a cold email need to be part of a chain of, of cold emails or different contact points? What I'm asking here is, does a subject line, for example, evolve over the course of a series of emails or is each one individually siloed? When I'm thinking about prospecting over like a sequence or cadence or whatever the terminology your company uses, you're telling a full story over the course of a sequence. But sure. the other thing that you're doing is you're finding five or six different ways to make a connection with that prospect. So I'm not actually changing my course of action on my prospecting on a sequence. If, if my talking point isn't necessarily 
the value prop. That's not what's going to change with the subject line. What's going to change is the personalization. So if I look at your LinkedIn profile, for example, I have where you're from. I have schools you might have gone to. I have recent social posts you might have done. I have recent social activity that you participated in. I have recommendations people have written about you. I've got stuff in your job description, past experience, mutual connections. All those things are different angles that I could bring up on a cold email. And I might pick five of those things at the beginning of my sequence. I start every sequence with write five things down about this prospect that you could bring up as talking points mm -hmm. that aren't related necessarily to your product. Because you're a rep. You shouldn't know your product at this point. If you don't, go bug your manager and <laughs> teach you this stuff. Um, and if you're a manager, make sure you're teaching your team this stuff so that they can focus on the important stuff, which is making a real connection with the prospect. After you have those five things down, that becomes when you switch your talk tracks. If I try three or four things with you and I'm like, the drummer angle's not working, I'm going to bring up uh, something else about Will. I might switch to your hometown and maybe I went to visit your hometown sometime. Sure. Or maybe maybe you're connected with someone or had someone on your podcast that I'm familiar with or I've met a couple times. That's what you can do. Like The idea is that your, your switch of subject lines should be corresponding. I actually don't mind doing the reply thing, like the re and keeping the same thread as long as it's about the same subject. So when I'm doing my follow-up after I send an email, it might be like, well, I wrote an email to you last week about uh, being a drummer. Here's a video of me doing a drum solo. And it might just be me slamming my hands on a table and really looking really stupid. But like, I'm really terrible at drums, but I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that. Like, I'm just using that as a fake angle, by the mm -hmm. way, in this, but like... I'm going to get 50 emails tomorrow when this goes out, Ryan, of people doing that, <laughs> trying to pitch me on, on different drumming things. Yeah, I'm disclosing personal information. By the way, Will's home address is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's subject lines, right? That's kind of that's kind of how it works. You want to try and get something that's vague enough. Uh, think of it almost like you ever click on link bait and you're like, oh man, I hate that I clicked on that, but I did. That's kind of what you want to do with a subject line. Like, per, uh, people are getting so many cold emails every day, and the last thing I want to do is see a cold email about your product mm -hmm. or your marketing buzzword you're going to use in your product yeah. or something generic. I want to see a subject that's like, okay, I'm going to open that email. It's something about me. I know it sounds vain, but that's how prospects are wired. That's how we're all wired, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we've got the subject line and we've got this um, this concept now of it matches with the email itself and then the cadence can shift along uh, the topics that we're trying to get wrap the people up in uh, and get that reply rate higher with. So with that, Ryan, what comes after the subject line when you are rating a cold email? So... The next thing we look at when we're breaking down a cold email is we're going to look at the length and the spacing. Uh, the general rule of thumb, unless you're doing something that's really customized with some unique content, the general rule of thumb that we judge an email on and how to get an A is to not make it more than a smartphone screen long. You don't want to have someone scroll. I, let's be honest here. I don't know if it's like this for you, Will. I'm going through emails when I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> like that's that's sort of the that's like if I'm go if I'm using the bathroom in the middle of the day, I'm crushing through emails through, my, through that. I usually will go through 30 or 40 emails while I'm just in the bathroom for five minutes. Um, other people might be in a pre COVID world. They might've been checking their emails on a subway or the Metro or, or uh, either in an Uber or somewhere. The mm -hmm. thing is, if you're on your phone looking at stuff, scrolling actually can be really hard to do. And you want to get your point across in as few words as possible. What happens? So, like, so, spacing support. so, so that, that, that logically makes total sense, right? Ryan, of course it does. And I'm, I guess we've been told this previous with previous guests and, and probably previous conversations to you and I as well. But what happens yeah. if I'm I'm playing devil's advocate here, but from perhaps a new salesperson who doesn't know any better? So you can she can elaborate on this. What happens if I need to elaborate on a few things for the email to be effective? Or perhaps we're not talking about product yet. We're not talking about services. But perhaps the thing that I found that is really interesting that I can connect with this buyer on requires seven paragraphs to get it across. Is this okay? Is, is that an exception to the rule that can work? Or should we always be aiming just for the, the one page? So the problem is if you make a really long first email with a lot of information in it, what happens if the person by some miracle agrees to do a call with you? What are you going to talk about? You just shot all your bullets off in the email. You're going to just read the email to them? That's a good way to think <laughs> about it. One of the nice parts about like cadences and sequences and stuff like that is you can take those whole narratives and spread them across 15 activities. Mm -hmm. Some of that stuff you might bring up on a call. Um, usually what you do at a company is you want to have like four to six value drivers that you bring up when you're prospecting. And those value drivers fit for each persona that you're going after. And you only want to bring up, you want to kind of not ditch one value driver. Because the way it works today, this is, this is alarming. This is true, Will. Did you know that according to HubSpot, Reply rates last year were less than 1% on cold emails. That doesn't surprise me whatsoever. It's 
it's yeah the world is on fire there's an asteroid coming for earth and sales is earth and the only way that we're going to reverse this trend is by thinking about what does the prospect actually want to get i actually maybe this is zooming out a little bit but i have this vision that going through and looking at cold emails should be as fun as watching super bowl ads like every agency puts their i think we've said this on the show before too but like you want to put a lot of thought into it. Why can't cold emails be entertaining? Why can't the person be like, oh, that's good? Like, no one ever thinks about what the prospect's feeling when they're reading this stuff. Mm -hmm. Everyone just assumes everyone wants to get right to business. You can get right to business, but you only need one sentence to get to business. The rest of the email can be mainly about the prospect and trying to cause action. How does that translate, um, Ryan, if you're selling a more quote unquote serious product? You're selling financial services, perhaps to other banks or something like that. Do we still have that leeway? I love this question. Um, Let me ask you something, Will. Are car accidents funny? No. Yeah. Yet, how many car insurance uh, companies make funny ads all the time on TV? I can't think of anything less funny than getting in a car accident. And yet, we still still use humor because they can't go run ads where they show people getting in car accidents and be like, we'll be there for you. Like, that'd make you feel weird. Prospect. It'd probably be a good ad though, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it would cut through the noise. In, yeah, maybe in the 60s and 70s that worked. But the problem is, every, like, the, all these ads that were standing out here, if I'm someone that's in a position to buy, I'm probably an extraordinary person. That's how I climbed at the company. I know how to play the politics there. I know how to, I have uh, strategic vision that's future thinking. And that's what decision makers really have that have impact on buying. Mm-hmm. If you're reaching out to an extraordinary person and you send them a dull email, do you think they're going to think you're extraordinary and are they going to stop what they're doing to try and reach out to you? And I, I'll tell you this, actually. I hope people listening to this in Europe hear this. Europe is behind on this, too. I think Europe, there's a there's a trend where a lot of people think that uh, when you're prospecting in Europe, you need to be more serious and down to business. I'm not telling you to go be silly all the time. You can do other stuff, too, but be interesting. That's the worst crime you mm. can commit in writing a cold email. So we're, we are jumping ahead a little bit on the criteria, but like, when we look at cold emails, we'll look at like, there's some other things that we answer and questions that we look at. But like, one of the things you want to ask is, does this email actually make me like the person that's emailing me? I think no one ever thinks of that. I, I think you I think you just touched on something really uh, interesting here in that for me, a stereotypical stuck up English person drinking lots of tea, right, Ryan? That pitch, you pitching me that an email needs to be entertaining is... I, I'm on board with everything saying, clearly. We've, we've had this conversation a million times on the podcast. But the stereotypical British person, you picture me that an email has got to be entertaining is probably less um, digestible than an email that's got to be interesting. An interesting email can still be not formal. But you, do you get where I'm going with this? When you say an, an, yeah. an email should be interesting and grab attention, I can still talk about serious things. I can still go about things in, in a cool uh, and novel way. Or even novel, maybe that's another way of looking at it. Um, so maybe that's a different way to frame it up for us Europeans who are behind the curve rather than US, um, what do you call it, the Super Bowl entertainment and um, nipples slipping in the, the part-time show. Yeah, don't do that in a cold <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah, funny. well, it depends, it depends who's doing it. Probably not you or I, though. We're not going to get good reply rates ourselves. But yeah, maybe pitching interesting emails is another, another way to frame it up. Yeah, I think I think... I, a lot of people think entertaining means funny. It doesn't have to necessarily uh-huh. be funny. That's the thing. It can just be something. I mean, the, at the end of the day, I, it's, this is really informal and people are going to hear this like, it dismiss me. But like at the end of the day, these executives that you're pitching to, they go home and get in fights with their kids and their wife. Yeah. They, they, uh, they go home and have a beer. They, they're vulnerable. Like they, they have problems. They're human beings too. They're not just like these super people. Now, they're, they're extraordinary in the workplace, which is how they get to that position. Extraordinary people like being around other extraordinary people. It's one of the reasons that we always hear about like celebrities dating each other. And like all these people are buddies and friends that are in certain different circles and stuff. Uh, and that's, that's part of it. You want to, if you want to seem like you're in that circle, you need to show some cool things that you have about yourself. Like do a talent audit when you become a rep. We, we are kind of going off the rails a little bit on some that's stuff, fine. but that's it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Like, Think about, you didn't grow up and say, boy, I can't wait to work in sales. Think of things that you have in your life that you could put into your prospecting that make you seem interesting. Uh, there's things that we do all the time. And I know this because you guys are all posting on social. The people that are doing this, if you're going and 
apple picking or boating or fishing and you caught a crazy fish, why couldn't that be in a prospecting email? Like, why couldn't you tell someone about that? Who, which person am I more likely to reach out to? The person that emails me and spams me five bullets about mm-hmm. my product and says, can we get a 15 minutes to chat? Or the person says, check out this huge fish I caught this weekend. Uh, I'm not sure if you're into fishing, but uh, <laughs> we have something that might be able to help you. Like, and There's definitely some fishing puns you could throw at the end of that for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, that's a little meta for the selling world, but you know what I mean? Like, you, you could tell, there's definitely some metaphors there. <laughs> Good. Well, with that then, Ryan, we've got the subject line. We've got the the length of the email, and now we're getting into, I guess, the next subject of making the buyer feel special or feel something. Is that is that the the next kind of category here that we need to look at? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, uh, we actually did a podcast about what makes good cold emails. Like I think like probably four or five years mm-hmm. ago now, Will. And something changed from from that podcast to this podcast that I've learned from prospecting more. You have to lead with what's special about the prospect now. It used to be, I used to tell people when they were doing prospecting, like lead with why you're contacting them. And the thing that's different now is a lot of people decide if they're going to read an email from a preview text. So on my phone, on my phone, I get a badge that says I got a new email. What it shows me is it shows me that who it's from Mm -hmm. and the badge will have the first two or three sentences of the email. If the first two or three sentences are something that's customized about me, I'm way more likely to open it. It's almost as important as your subject line now because I I think I've read some stats too that say that uh, during the workday on business phones, over 30, 38% of the emails, I think is what it was, are opened on a phone. So that's one thing that's really important. The other thing is if they're using a mail client like Outlook or Google, they're also showing those preview messages in the inbox view. So the first thing you want to lead with is what's how is this prospect special to you? It's almost like the purpose of a cold email now is no longer to say, hey, buy my product, let's get a meeting or qualify or disqualify out. Maybe it is to you. The real purpose of a cold email is to get a response. And the best way to get a response is to prove that the prospect's important to you. What would be an example of that, Ryan? Because it's it's one thing to say that, right? But what, what does that look like in, in reality? Yeah, um, let's do, can we do the drummer example again? Since of course just closing. Yeah. yeah, so maybe I'll be like, hey, Will, uh, let's pretend I was trying to sell you a great, uh, audios, a, a new new software for making podcasts, right? Sure. I might say, hey, Will, uh, I noticed that you mentioned you used to be a drummer. I I actually play music too. I play synthesizer. Uh, this is this is a clip of some audio that I've made. Anyways, you're doing podcast stuff. You transitioned this. I have a way that you could make podcasts way easier and edit them and turn around your podcast 5X. What are your thoughts on talking? That's a much better short, crisp email that says, I care about you because I mentioned the drummer thing. Mm-hmm. I found common ground with you because I'm not just saying, hey, you're a drummer. Let me sell to you. I'm saying, hey, you're a drummer. I also am a musician. We should talk about music. We could also talk about prospecting a little bit or talk about podcasting a little bit. So yeah. like, you bring up something that shows I have common ground. It's almost like when we were in school, um, the people you made friends with were people that you had things in common with. Like I, 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 do, this, uh, I do a guest lecture at the University of New Hampshire uh, for prospecting. I run two classes. I'm actually doing one this week. One of the things I always tell people, I was like, hey, who's friends with each other in this class? How'd you guys meet? And I always hear their stories. Someone met doing hockey camp together. Someone met because their parents were mutual friends growing up. It's all the same stuff you get off LinkedIn. You And if you're going to create a friendship for that, that's the way you do it. You have to drive something that you have common ground with for them. That's how you prove that someone's special to you. It's finding common ground. It's proving that you did the research. It's basically saying, why am I picking you? I have thousands of prospects I could pick. Why am I spending my time talking to you? So I'm going to call out the elephant in the room here, Ryan, for a lot of the audience because they are spamming the shit out of the marketplace with what they call personalized emails, which includes none of this, right? And they're probably thinking, Ryan, this sounds fantastic, but I've only got 12 hours uh, you know, to work each day, you know, less than that. By the time you, you've commuted and traveled and everything else, or you know, maybe it's not 12 hours for the average salesperson, whatever it is. Um, how do they go about implementing some of this when so far in their sales career, they've never gone one-on-one with an email, which pains me to say, right? It probably pains you. But how do they make this this shift? Is it just a total shift that they need to make or is this something that can be compromised i'll give you a tactical way to do it and then i'll give you something for managers and you're a manager listening sure but just make sure i don't forget the second one 
The tactical thing to do if you want to get in the habit of doing this is you want to make sure you still do enough activities every day. At a minimum, I think a rep should be able to send 30 personalized emails a day. I think that's a realistic expectation for your company. If you have some other bottlenecks and administrative stuff with the tools that you use, obviously that's one of the reasons my company exists. Mm -hmm. Um, But if if you can get rid of bottlenecks and be optimized, you should be able to send six personalized emails an hour. And if you're doing six an hour, uh, that means it takes 10 minutes to write an email. Here's a good thing you can do to get focused. Because it's very easy to get sucked in a wormhole when you're researching a prospect off LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever you're looking at for the information about them. Maybe reading an article about the company or something. Set a timer on your phone or on your computer. I call it the 10-minute game. You have 10 minutes to find a prospect, research them, find information about them. We talked about some of the things you can personalize earlier. Bring those things up, write an email, and hit send. And if you can't do it in 10 minutes, your punishment is you have to drop them into an automated sequence. (laughs) That's your, and so like you are trying to, you don't want to drop someone into a sequence, yep. but you have 10 minutes. That means if you get slacked, you ignore it. You get emailed, you ignore it. You focus your head down doing that email. If you do that for 10 minutes, here's what happens, Will. Some people that you work with, it only takes four or five minutes. Some people that research, it might take nine minutes. But if you set that 10 minute limit and have a timer for 10 minute sprints every day, uh, we used to do this with my team everybody would always hit their activity goal of that 30 cold emails. They're doing some calls too, but like the 30 cold emails, you figure six hours a day, you're doing prospecting uh, with the email and you you splice in you know an hour or two of calls plus your administrative meetings that you have to do. Mm-hmm. And you start adding that stuff up. But that's kind of the, the rule. And here's what's magical. You get really good at this if you do it after a couple of weeks. It's like muscle memory. You start finding things right away. Yep. Like I can look at a profile really quick and come up with like, what am I going to do to personalize this person right now? What am I going to come up with? But it's it's pattern recognition, isn't it? Yeah. And you get in the habit of what to look for, what angles you have, and you start thinking of things in your head. And there's some stuff you can reuse too. If I see you're into drumming, maybe I'll find another prospect that's into drumming and I can bring up the same exact point again. Like I have points about myself that I can find common ground with. Yeah. Maybe I see a prospect has a dog and I'm like, I'm going to send them a, cl- a picture of my dog Finnegan in this email. And then, I'm going to, and then I can do that again with a different prospect. But you get in this. And what ends up happening is over a couple of weeks, that 10-minute game turns into an eight-minute game where you can change the timer to eight minutes. And then you can change it to five minutes. And guess what you're doing now? You're now doing 40 to 50 personalized emails a day that are actually getting better response rates. On our team, for example, at Lead IQ, we don't allow people to send automated sequences. We do have some automated sequences that go out for like marketing activities, mm-hmm. like if you sign up for a webinar or something. Um, but if you're someone that comes in straight up and you're an outbound deal, we don't allow anyone on our team to do sequencing like that. We have personalized sequences along the way. There might be one or two steps that are automated, but the point I'm getting at is uh, these people on our team get double digit response rates. So. What really, you, this is the manager part. This is the transition. I can't believe I'm hitting this home for people. But if you're a manager listening to this, stop tracking prospecting volume. I know you're probably thinking my reps are lazy. Here's what you need to track. <laughs> track your prospecting efficiency. Mm. See how many touches it takes for a rep to get a meeting. And, and track that number religiously. And if your rep's hitting a good prospect activity to uh, ratio where they're doing a lot of stuff to get meetings, like they're getting meetings, but they're not doing enough activity, that's when you can coach them on activity. That's when you can look for ways to get rid of bottlenecks and optimize your sales team. It seems almost then, Ryan, we should be looking at number of conversations a day as opposed to number of emails sent a day as the the holy grail market. And I I don't think many companies do that. Yeah, you know know what it's kind of like in baseball here in the United States? uh, Like, we look at batting average. That's how you know if you're a good baseball player. They'll say, what what do they hit when they go up to bat? A good batting average in, in baseball is usually, you know, anyone from 250 or above for a batting average is what they say, 0.25 or whatever. It's 25% chance of getting on base. What we're doing in prospecting today is most sales managers are looking at how many at bats someone has. And I don't understand why that would ever be useful. That's that's like it's like, oh, let's see how much they try. Mm. If you're not producing results, it doesn't matter. And that that's kind of what it comes down to. I did this is true, Will. I actually did uh last year. I prepped for a talk. I did prospecting for a couple of months on Fridays and I tracked all the measurements for it and doing the rate, my pitch criteria that we're talking about today, I had a 42% response rate, which is crazy. Not all of them were positive. Some of them were like, Hey, objection. But when you get that response, the next step that you do is you can pick up the phone and call that person and say, Hey, I saw you get this response. I figured it'd be easier to talk to you on the phone instead of giving you a really long email. 
and that you have to read and then and then you're like oh man this stinks so like it's it's an easy transition to get the response the response is basically them raising their hand to give context for you to contact them um there are other questions we should go through for the email but yeah that's that's sort of like my mindset for why it's important to do that personalization it doesn't have to be that much either i mean i i've seen studies that sales loft did uh with john barrows where they mentioned uh 20 is really all you need to do to spend on personalization the thing that i think is a little different from my approach is you do that 20 percent, you find common ground but your value proposition also is personalized to them too mm-hmm Okay, so let's move on further down the email. And so we've had the subject line, we've talked about the length, we've made the the buyer feel special, we've made them feel something when they open it. Um, next, why are we contacting them? Is that the, the next point that we've got to explain? Yeah, exactly. Well, wow, you've done your research, feels good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so what you want to do is, uh, one of the things that really stinks is when you write an email to someone, you do a bunch of personalization and you don't want to do the old bait and switch where you're like, oh, they really made me feel fuzzy. And then you're like, Wait, but they didn't tell me what they didn't wait. They're trying to sell to me. You want to kind of be transparent about that at the beginning uh, so that you ease them in. So what I would do is write something that's about the person and then mention like, want to know if we could talk like you set up the context of where the email is going afterward. Your transition statement is why you're contacting them. So if I bring up that you're a drummer, I'm going to say, uh, hey, well, we're both musicians. I grew up playing music. You grew up playing music. Want, uh, wanted to actually know if we could talk about music and maybe some prospecting stuff together. Or, or podcasting in the thick example that we've made for this. Yeah. So you make a transition statement. If you don't state why you're gonna why you're contacting someone, they actually don't really know what to expect. And it might be like, why am I getting this email? It's a little awkward. Um, so you want to answer that question with the email. Here's a good test for this. If you printed out an email and gave it to a random person in the street and said, What's going on? What what is this email? A person in the street should completely understand the context of everything. That means you've written a good email because you have to assume that your prospect doesn't know your company, doesn't realize it's a cold email. That's another thing we all assume is that everyone's like, oh, they know it's a cold email, they'll take a meeting. So why are you contacting me? You have to ask what, you're, what you want them to do at, at that point. The next question that you have to answer is, who are you? And this is something that a ton of companies do wrong. They introduce themselves in cold emails. I know there's studies out there that say like, introducing yourself is fine, it's okay. I actually don't think it's fine. It makes your email longer and it causes you as a prospector to get into me speak, which means that if I say, hey, Will, this is Ryan O'Hara, you're instantly starting an email where you're going to start talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you get that out of your vernacular at all, don't mention it in the email. You're going to you're going to actually end up using that space for your value proposition instead. And those are the four four to six value drivers that you have uh, for your company, for each uh, person you're going after, what type of profile or what type of customer you're going after. With the who are you question, is that not answered in the email signature or could we not use your email signature to inadvertently add that? So when we rate cold emails, we used to do it where we judge someone's signature too. But what I'm learning is a lot of people don't send their email signature when they submit cold emails to us. Um, but yeah, you want, you should have the who are you. I'll give you a little tip, everyone that's listening for your email signature. I think a lot of people mail in their email signature and just put stuff the company tells you. Yep. I don't... You, if you're using a video prospecting platform, you should make a video of you talking to the camera. Be like, hey, mm-hmm. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Ryan O'Hara. I grew up in New Hampshire. Um, I used to live in my mom's basement. Now I'm a VP of marketing. Um, tell a story in a quick video that's less than a minute long that just humanizes it. Because not only are you sending that video uh, and making them feel guilty if they end up clicking around your signature and looking around for the website and stuff, um, but if they click, that's a trigger event for you to pick up the phone and call them. Yep. If they click your video, you're going to have link tracking probably on it. And you're going to say, you can call and say, hey, I saw you watch my video. I assume the cold email wasn't that good or, or you're more interested in me instead of the cold email. What's up? And you have a way of starting your conversation. Uh, the other interesting part on an email signature is you also uh, make it easier for someone to call you if you have a good email signature. You don't really need to lay out redundant information in the body of the email. Got it. It makes all sense. And this that mirrors what we've done over at Salesman.org. We've done some testing. I don't think we've talked about this publicly, but um, in our training, we recommend that you create at least one or two industry uh, insight articles, basically. We, we guide people through the process. Dead simple. Just to tee you up as an expert, as opposed to someone who's just pounding on a phone, cold emailing, spamming people. We're trying to differentiate uh, people are kind of members away from that uh, in the eyes of the buyer. And the, I, again, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, so I don't want to butcher it because it'll come out in the next few weeks in, in some data that we're publishing. 
But the number of people from a cold email who read the email, then click the link to that expert article, which is hosted on LinkedIn, and then end up engaging with people on LinkedIn is double figures. It's a really high number, even in, it, it, almost as high as the reply rate from the emails themselves. So just that bit of real estate at the bottom of your email address, uh, at the bottom of your email, your cold emails, is really valuable. I don't think anyone takes advantage of this. When I first joined Weed IQ, I think it was 2000. It's been like five years now. I'm get, I got gray hair now. What, I feel like I've aged like a Dude, million years. I think I, cause I'm getting gray hair as well. We should. This is a weird thing to say on a podcast that tens of thousands of people can hear. We should compare gray hair as we move forward. And uh, <laughs> it'll be every episode. Every episode we do, I'll just put it in the show notes. Who's going gray quicker? Because I'm pretty sure I am. I just keep thinking about um, the hawk that in in Royal Tenenbaums that comes back and has white feathers. <laughs> <laughs> That's like me now. Anyway, um, in my email signature, I when I first started Weed IQ, I made a video of like me trying to Billy Mays Weed IQ. Like, do you guys know who Billy Mays is? Do you know who he is? Well, mm, I know the name, but it, it, the, the yeah in the in the um, in America in the like early two thousands, this guy basically did all these infomercials. Oh yeah, like, do you want to uh, yep, like yep. yeah? He's like he actually died doing cocaine apparently mm-hmm. or something, but like. Um, I tried to do a video where I tried elevator pitch lead IQ really quickly. And I put in my email signature um, for prospecting and stuff. I don't promote that video that much. I've done, I think I did a LinkedIn post about it once, but like on back then we didn't have video prospecting platforms when I first joined here. And now we do, obviously Uh, the video has 3,600 views and it's in my signature. Yeah. So that's like the, that's, those are, that's 3,600 prospects that went and watched that video um, that wouldn't have seen it just by having that email signature. You're literally walking away from people that could sit down and watch something really quickly about you. Yeah, and that, that might be the difference between someone who goes, okay, this seems like a decent fit. Ryan seems like a, an interesting guy. He's, he's, he's pulled this out of my, my past and history. I'll probably get on, have a chat with him, but I'm not sure if this is going to work for me or I'm, I'm busy, I've not got time. That one little layer of depth deeper where it's a, a video like that where there's probably a bit of humor involved in it i'm sure or what we teach where you're setting yourself up as, a, as an expert in the space that could be the difference between getting a, a call or not getting a call and it's something you do once and then is used hundreds or thousands of time again so that the, the time and productivity payoff from this is massive isn't it yeah and you know what else people don't think about either is uh if i'm a v let's say i'm a vp of sales right and I'm getting emailed from Weed IQ, and I'm getting emailed from another person that competes with Weed IQ. Yeah. Which email am I going to respond to? The one that I feel like I know the rep and have some guilt. <laughs> <laughs> like guilt is real. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's that's the reason we do these things. The metaphor that I use is that there are two types. Of, I think I said this on your show before too, which makes you feel lame. But like, there are two types of people in this world. There are people that drive pickup trucks, and there are people that ask their friends who have pickup trucks to move stuff for them. Mm-hmm. You want to be the person that drives the pickup truck, obviously, but people don't want to say no to you. That's why your friend moves stuff for you when you don't own a pickup. So that's kind of that's kind of a good way to think about it. Like make make something that shows and feathers your your personality. If you and Will, if Will, if you and I both worked at Meet IQ and we were writing emails to people, they should actually be very different because we have different backgrounds and yep. different places and different personalities. And that it should be the same thing at these different companies that you work at. Yeah, that's probably a good acid test for anyone who's listening. If you're just copying a template that your boss has given you, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> you might have had success in the past, but it's going to get more and more difficult in the future. So with that, Ryan, does that, oh, I think there's one final part from my notes I've got scribbled down here. And that is essentially a call to action. Do our emails need this and what should it be? Yeah. So here's a rule of thumb. You can only ask a prospect to do one thing in an email. Yeah. If you're asking for a meeting, ask for a meeting. If you're attaching a white paper, you're asking them to watch, look at the white paper. If you're asking them to watch a video, you can in the video say that you want them to obviously watch and click and listen and stuff. But yeah, that's kind of the way I'd look at it. If you, uh, best call to actions, I've done a bunch of tests. I know there's apps like Crystal Knows out there that use disk and personality and stuff. I don't think direct questioning is the best way to end an email. Uh, what I would do is ask an open-ended question. How does this sound? Does this seem, uh, uh, how does this align with your goals for this year? Um, what are your thoughts? I, anyone that knows me makes fun of me for this, but I end every email with what are your thoughts, even when I'm not doing a sales email. The reason is because if I ask a yes or no question, if I'm like, hey, Will, can I have 15 minutes to chat? What are your options? Yes or no. Right. right. And the no is usually no reply. Mm-hmm. Very rarely will you, if you want to increase your reply rates on a cold email, ask an open, open-ended question. Instead of saying, 
do you have 15 minutes to chat? Ask, what are your thoughts on talking for 15 minutes? Or or I actually don't even do the 15 minutes. I just would say, what are your thoughts? Um, The reason is because if you say no, you say, listen, I don't think I'm interested. uh, And they're going to usually give you a reason why. That's what you'll get out of that. And that reason why turns into a whole talk track for the rest of your cadence or sequence. Or it turns into you calling them and saying, hey, I just want to clarify why you feel this way. And you have different objection trees and how to deal with that stuff. So uh, you need a call to action. Let me know is not a call to action, by the way. Never say let me know in an email. Yeah. I hate that. And don't say I'd love to talk or I'd love to meet. I do that sometimes too. I get an I love talk. It's like, no kidding. You want to do that. You obviously want a yeah. commission check. Um, one other part we did, we did a rate my pitch last Thursday with Josh Braun, um, who, if you guys don't know, he's a pretty, he's, he's like, he helps a lot of people in the States and stuff uh, with cold email and stuff. Josh actually adds another question. He says, so what? Like you want to answer so what at the end of the email? So like, why is this? Or in the when you're explaining your value proposition, make sure that you're beating that so what question that come, could come up afterward. And what what does it mean to beat the so what question? Is this you're looking at it from the perspective of the buyer and they're going so what st- every line so what who cares why why are you contacting me? Is that what? We're yeah yeah. To do so here? for example, let's pretend that I was calling reaching out to you and I said, hey, Lead IQ will help optimize your sales team. We'll get rid of bottlenecks in your productivity and make you more productive. Uh, I'm making this up. Um, we'll expand your reach with data, blah, 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 blah. You could say, so what? What you really want to do is tie that back into a feeling. Tie that back into the pain. The story that Josh tells is that he was uh, at a place getting stuff to buy for car washing. He went to an auto store to yeah. car- wash his car. And the guy actually had a bucket um, that you could rub your sponge at the bottom and it would take the rocks off the sponge. And the guy was like, the guy basically said, Hey, you should get this bucket instead. Um, it, and, he, and Josh was like, so what? It cost a lot more money. And the guy's answer was, well, you can rub the sponge at the bottom of the bucket. Mm-hmm. Those rocks in the sponge could scratch your car, which will bring down the value of your, your resale value, value of your car. That's the so what that you want to be. So your value proposition when you're doing the who are you needs to answer that so what question. You're doing, uh, or Josh is doing a good job with that story because he's told it on the podcast twice as well. So that's like the, th- <laughs> the third time the, third <laughs> time the audience have heard it. Everyone's getting repeats, but yeah. it's 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 something that that's uh, holds true. I actually was thinking about things that I've purchased recently. Like for example, at my house here we have a pellet stove. Um, do, do you guys have those there? Yeah, like in, yep. yeah. So I have a pellet stove, and I have to pick what wood pellets to get. And I went to the pellet store the other day to figure out what wood pellets to buy for the season because it gets really cold here. And the guy was trying to convince me to get pellets that were a hundred dollars more per ton. And I had to debate, oh, why should I get why should I get these pellets? And he told me that it would be less maintenance on my machine, less wear and tear, which will save me money in the long run. And my house will be warmer than if I use the cheaper pellets. And I ended up getting the more expensive one. And the reason was because I thought that was a compelling reason to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let me just ask you this, Josh. Um, uh, Ryan, sorry. And, <laughs> I've become Josh probably with my favorite storytelling. <laughs> um, let me ask you this, and I'm trying to be, um, um, I'm trying to be uh, open as I say this. Do you have data on asking an open-ended question? Because we've got data on asking a closed-ended question, and, and our data shows that that is more effective. And I, and I, I can tell you a little bit about that in a second. But is this yeah. anecdotal, or is, do you have data on it as well? So our our data, what we did is we did an experiment. This is a couple of years old now, though, sure. when we did this. Um, so. It, Maybe it's changed since then, but um, our data showed from having me and someone on our team, John Mazza, we're both prospecting, and we both uh, wrote emails together one day. It was when I was running that, like the SDR team. This mm-hmm. is a couple years ago. Yep. I I did open ended questions. He did very. We wrote emails where some of them were open ended, some of them were asking for fifteen minutes, which was more direct. The open ended questions had a plus three percent response rate. So uh, I don't plus three percent is a big number in the context of a 5% response rate in general, right? Right. If you're sending 100 emails a week, yeah. well, you're hopefully doing more, but if you're sending 100 emails a week, that's an extra That's an extra uh, 12 responses for the yeah. week. Good. Just to, I know uh, I'm not always the best with numbers, but 3% doesn't sound like nothing, but it's a big deal. Uh, great. The reason, that, the reason I ask that is we've got data, and what I always tell people to do is, at the end of the email, say something on the lines of, does it make sense to... X Y Z. So Ooh, it's, that's good. I like that. That's good. And and what happens when we when I when I say this typically Ryan is I, and this happens to me. I'll get a response back saying, 
it doesn't make sense too because of X, Y, Z. So the buyer then is almost coaching you on uh, objections and how to deal with them as opposed to just saying, I'm not interested. So that, that's how we frame yeah, it up. I, th- I, think that, I think that's better than just a yes or no question. I, mean, course, I know yeah. you're asking a yes or no question, but it still prompts a little bit more of a response. The comparison that I make to it is like human nature w- like has these impulses where we want to respond to things. It's kind of like, um, have you ever seen the movie 40 Old Virgin? Yep. Uh, there's, there's a scene where Steve Carell's character doesn't know how to talk to girls. And one of the guys was <laughs> like, let's go to the bookstore and talk to a gr- go talk to that mm-hmm. girl that works there. Just act like David Caruso in CSI. Just ask questions like you're do- a detective. And the whole time he just flirts with her by asking questions back and mirroring whatever she says back. Yep. And it, obviously it's a joke scene. It, the whole joke is that he's like really awkward and ask really dumb questions back. But it keeps the conversation going if you're having questions that aren't just yes or no. Um, I, I will tell you this, Will. I think that um, I do think that there's a possibility too that like cold emailing is less effective now than it was three years ago, and it was less effective than it was three years before that. The problem, if you're listening to this episode, is that it's becoming less and less effective, and that's because people we're teaching prospects to ignore emails when we send automation. When you send a template, you're not just hurting yourself and your company's brand; you're hurting sales as an industry you're hurting all the listeners on here that are also going to reach out to that person someday whether they're at that company or the next company that they work at so you have to think about that like we have a chance to reverse this trend let's make a good positive experience for people when they're going through their inbox and not hating going through cold emails communicate clearly so they understand what the hell is going on and why they actually want to talk to you for your company it make sure it's concise and easy to consume show them that you like them and that they they're important to you mm-hmm. and show that you're different Show that like you're you're someone that's special and that they're special and two special people should come together. Perfect. Well, one layer to add on top of that, Ryan, I'm sure you agree with this, that your personal brand is now on the line as well. Whereas 10 years ago, you were a rep representing whatever widget company. Now you're an individual with your own LinkedIn profile that you're taking from company to company to, you know, as your career progresses. And if you spam a whole marketplace and just even if it's, like just a layer higher than the buyer's subconscious and then you contact them again from another company, they're going to recognize your profile picture because you, you probably don't look too much different. Me and you might look different with our gray hair in a few years. <laughs> but your personal brand is on the line if, you, if you're spamming people and annoying the marketplace as well. So that's kind of my kind of extra push for people to customize emails because I think we're on the same um, track of all of this, Ryan. And with that, mate, we've mentioned it, but tell us where we can find Rate My Pitch and where we can find more about yourself and Lead IQ as well. Yeah. So at the moment, if you are looking to try and figure out, let's say you heard all these things that Will and I talked about today and you're like, oh man, I feel like I don't have any time (laughs) to actually do this. We can get rid of a bunch of annoying parts and steps in prospecting and optimize it so you're a lot faster with your prospecting. Uh, If you want to check that out, you can just email me, ryan at leadiq.com. On the rate my pitch stuff, the best thing to do would probably be to add me on LinkedIn because I'll post about it every time we're doing one. Um, we're going to be building a rate my pitch section of the website with all the old recordings. We've done it with probably tons of people, Will, that you've had on your podcast yep. um, before. I I wish there was a legal way to do calls because we'd love to do it for calls, but you really can't do it without permission from the prospect afterward. So submitting calls is kind of tough. But if you want to submit a cold email for the next rate my pitch that we do, um, we have an address we set up at leadiq, rate my pitch at leadiq.com. You just send an email there, and what I'll do, I want to note, it won't be blocked out. The information will be public, but I'll throw it in the next time we do one. Uh, I'll go through the inbox. That's what I basically do. I've reviewed probably, since I've been at Lead IQ, probably three or 4,000 different cold emails over the years. Wow. Is there any, oh, final question, I know we're wrapping up the show here, but are there any overarching trends that you've seen shift over the years with, with emails, whether it be the content, the length, more customization, less customization? Is there anything that you see is like overarching over the past four or five years? Yeah, I think there's a lot, it's a lot easier to get data on what's working and what's not working. Back in the old days, you basically would have to go to like a consulting firm or one of those sales shops to get data, but pretty much you buy software, you can check your reply rates. That's something that you need to be looking at every day. Don't, don't think if you get in a drought, uh, here's another tip that you can do too. Sometimes we just have writer's block when you're writing a cold email or something. If you get in a corner where you feel like, oh man, I just am in a rut. I can't get people to respond to me. Try and write your email as a fictional character. That's what I do. Like for example, when I was at Dine and I was selling DNS, I used to write cold emails as Wayne Campbell from Wayne's World. 
<laughs> like I'd write in that voice kind of, and I'd like put Zang at the end of an email with a thumbs up and like, I don't know, like, or find like ghost right as a character that you like on yep. TV or something. And you'll it'll help you get out of the run a little bit. And again, one final thing of this, I, I mentioned this on the podcast the other day. It's called twice. Now I have this post-it note just on the other side of the, the famous GTR on the table. It says, act like you're speaking to your younger self. So when I'm not necessarily pitching a middle-aged woman doing advertising, uh, you know, marketing and things like that, but when I'm creating the content, I try and be myself, but I try and imagine that I'm speaking to the young, stupid version of myself that needs a bit of coaching. And so there's probably an element of that that you could do with your emails as well of imagine, even just imagine writing to a real person. It's very difficult to do that when you're spamming a thousand emails or 500 emails at once, 20 emails, whatever it is. But I think there's a ton of value in this one, Ryan. And I think if you if you take that approach, I'll I'll link I'll link to uh, rate my pitch and in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org, and I'll link I'll uh, kind of break it down in the structure that you use that we've been through in this episode as well, so it can it can live on its own as a, as a blog post. But if you take that approach, and then you're treating the person that you're emailing as an actual person rather than just some you know number that you're kind of sending data to, it's all going to be you're going to be better off, aren't you? You've got to be. You know, um, if you are doing cold calling too, which we didn't really talk about cold calling today, but you can you can use a lot of the stuff we talked about today also on a call. It's the same structure for a cold call, except you have a little less time. Mm -hmm. So you have to get to the point a little faster. But um, let's say I call you, Will, at a company. I know we're wrapping up, but <clears throat> let's say I call you at a company and you're not the right person and you're like, hey, you need to talk to this person. Yep. Before you get off the phone, like, what's that person like? What are they like? Ask that question. If the person's not going to be like, they might be caught off guard, but be like, I don't want to write to them and, and be weird. I want to make sure I get something that they'll like. What What are they like outside of work? A ask those little questions when you talk to other people at the company. If you have a if you have a connection at a company you're trying to break into, and you don't, it's maybe it's the person that's not a prospect. Ping that person. And say, Hey, have you ever worked with this person before? What are they like? What are they into? Look at their LinkedIn recommendations too. You can kind of get a good idea of what kind of personality they are. Do you know what's mental? We have a whole, I think it's three or four hours worth of training on social engineering, which is what you just outlined then in our salesman.org training product, right? It's it's two different modules on how to, how to go about asking these questions. And fine, it's probably if you're doing a large enterprise deal, it's more suited for that than if you're selling a you know, $50 a month widget. But Ryan, no one's ever mentioned what you just described in social engineering on the podcast, other than the few people I've had to come on to talk about social engineering. That is a real yeah. travesty that no, like it means you're a pro, right? But it means it's a travesty for everyone else that this hasn't even come up in conversation. Yeah. You, if you do it, I mean, it's it, the whole idea here is we want to be peacocks. We want people to be like, holy crap, I got to stop. Who is that person I just talked uh -huh. to? You, you're writing emails right now. If you're listening to this and you're an SDR or an AE, you might be writing emails and cold calling right now, but you might be a CEO of a company someday. Think about that in your head when you're reaching out to these people. Act like that. Have that senior perspective of what's going on and break rules a little bit. Don't do things to be a jerk. So like be, be kind to people and be good, but like t take some chances sometimes. Do some things that are breaking, breaking from the status quo. Love it. Well, with that, Ryan, I want to thank you again for coming on the show, sharing your insights. Perhaps we'll do another one um, going over some of this again for cold calling in the future. And with that, mate, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks for having me. Hope we will be, uh, we'll have full gray hair next time. <laughs> <laughs>